identifiable as a human being as she is as a professional and, a, and a, an academic. I say this not only from my experience with her, but also from the opinions of the people who had the chance to work with her. Ophelia, it is an enormous pleasure to have you here with us tonight. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation and for giving us the chance to watch you share your knowledge with us. Thank you, Ana Maria. Um, I want to start by thanking you uh, for providing this opportunity for me. Uh, it's always for me a great pleasure when I have any type of exchange with Brazilian scholars. Um, I have had the opportunity to work with many of you. Um, I had the direct pleasure of being with you at the Graduate Center and it really warms my heart when I see that picture at West 111th Street, uh, sitting in a cafe, something that we have not been able to do here in New York City for a while now. So um, it's, uh, it's interesting to think about what uh, Zoom and this virtual reality provides, provides our links. Uh, for me, certainly a, a way of linking to Latin America in ways that I don't, Latin American scholars especially, uh, in ways that I don't um, in any other way. So that's a blessing. And then we're very near but very far. Um, and I look forward to the day in which we can again have a cup of coffee at West 111th Street or somewhere in New York City. Or in oh, I'm, I'm counting on that. I'm counting on that. Yeah. Oh, and thank you, Simone, for the, your introduction and opening up the space. Okay, Ophelia, so I'm going to start from a question. Uh, I mean, two questions, in fact, okay, two in one. They come from um, a quote from your book, uh, Bilingual Education in the 21st Century. You say that bilingual education is the only way to educate children in the 21st century. So I ask you first, uh, what should bilingual education in the 21st century be based on or should look like? And second, what are the essential knowledges for educating language teachers to prepare them for this century? Okay, um, so I think we all know that uh, even when we think that our classrooms are monolingual, our classrooms today are highly um, heterogeneous linguistically. There are uh, children of all kinds, of all types, um, and therefore, the idea that they have to be educated only in the language of the state according to uh, the standards set by the state seems to be a waste of human capacity uh, because children come in with many different language practices into classrooms um, and the only way that we're going to be able to educate them is if we can connect uh, to who they are, uh, to their knowledge systems, to their practices, to what's happening at home. You know, I spoke before about Zoom and the uh, advantages and the disadvantages, um, and I um, am struck by the fact that one of the things that has happened as I speak to teachers who are doing all of their teaching in remote kinds of ways is that for the first time they have watched in the, with their own eyes what is happening in the homes, right? Uh, so the mother sits and the, the child is doing work in English, of course, but the mother sits next to them and she is uh, talking to them in Spanish. There's stuff going on in Portuguese from all the Brazilians that we have in the city. Um, so it's been very interesting that actually <laughs> one of the benefits of all of this craziness that we are all experiencing is that in some ways the home and the school have gotten uh, more interdependent because teachers have to rely 
on, on the home and whoever is there in order for the children to be educated. Um, and parents for the very first time are also looking into what school is like. Um, so, I mean, I have uh, just last week, I was with a, um, a, a recently arrived Ecuadorian woman who did not speak English and was sitting with her fourth grader as she was doing remote schooling. And it was interesting to me to see all the negotiation because actually she was also learning English with her daughter as the lessons were going on. So anyway, that's, I've, I've sort of have gone because it's impossible for me um, to talk about anything without on this without addressing all the pain and all the suffering and all the despair and all the chaos that we're experiencing today uh, in education. So it's good to always find the, the bright spots, right? Uh, it's something that I did not anticipate in 2007, 2008, when I was writing bilingual education in the 21st century. I never thought that we would be here. Uh, but certainly the idea that no matter what we do, no matter who we are, um, we have to think of how to educate children bilingually or multilingually uh, without thinking that the whole objective of schooling is to teach a language or even two languages, but, with, but thinking that the reasons to educate bilingually is because it's good for the children, because it's good for the children, because we can then understand who they are in ways that are much more expansive than what we know when we're only um, seeing them through one language or through the, lang through the language of the, of the state and the dominant language in school. So that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question what is it that language teachers need to know? And I think that language teachers, one problem with all of us who are language teachers is that we like language. Um, and because we like it, we think that it's primordial. And I think the most important thing for a language teacher is to understand uh, that language is an instrument um, to express you know, concepts to express what it is, who we are, but it is not the goal and it is not, it, it can be very liberating and also very constricting. So we have to find ways of, if we are going to teach bilingually, if we are going to teach a second language or a foreign language or whatever, an additional language of whichever kind, I think the most essential uh, thing for a teacher to know is that what they're doing is they're teaching, again, the child, they're teaching the student, they're teaching the human being. Um, and um, how you get that person to then extend their repertoire so that they um, make sure that they actually build into their repertoire these new features that we, we as teachers call a new language, right? But how do we make them ours? And I think that's, that's very important. Uh, in order to do that, you have to do it in a way that you are really recognizing the strengths of the children, recognizing the whole repertoire, rather than thinking of just teaching them a language. So I would say, and I always say that the most important thing for a language teacher is what we call in English their stance. But sometimes it's very difficult to acquire because you have to be able to put yourself in, in the shoes of the, those uh, students um, but I think we can take steps towards it. Uh, and I've seen these ideologies shift as teachers work uh, with each other and with students. Um, so I would think the stance, the stance of um, what is language um, and what does language add and how do you get to language, not through language, but through the person, through the student. Uh, so that they can use language. I think that, that those are important things to start with. 
You mentioned uh, that when you uh, wrote your book in 2008, you were not expecting that we were, but who would ever, right, expect that we would live a situation like that. But even so, you predicted, because you said that the world is changing also because of technology, not only because of the migration movements and everything, but also because of technology. And technology has really, um, this good side, although it has the bad side that you said, that you mentioned, right, that we were talking before, but it has also this good side of um, shortening distances, right, so in, and giving access to other mm -hmm. things that happen in other languages as well, right? Right, right, right. Okay, well, uh, my second question then uh, is more related to translanguaging, right? And we have some researchers in our uh, graduate school that uh, work with um, immigration uh, communities, right? Uh, German, Italian, etc. And so one of our colleagues, right? I don't know if she's attending us, Karin Synapse, uh, asked me to ask you this question. Uh, what is new about the concept of translanguaging if we compare it to the former strategies to address the multilingualism present in classrooms by using the knowledge in one language to learn other languages? Uh, I thought uh, of the relation uh, of translanguaging with the metaphors that you use of the bicycle and the moon buggy uh, or the all-terrain vehicle. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. You want to explain what those are or you? you... No, you are going to explain. <laughs> you are, yeah. Everybody wants to, nobody wants to listen to me. Everybody wants to listen to you. <laughs> you, right? all, you all know all this. So uh, it's interesting that uh, you would ask me. Thank you for that question because I think it, what's important is to remember always that we always stand in on the shoulders of many others right and that uh, this is not something that is new in any way um i think that it is based on a lot of uh, sociolinguistic work throughout the world and through many people uh and um i think what is new is actually um the the conscient conscientization to use your um uh what the the one word that we all say in portuguese thinking of freire when we talk education um so um because there is this consciousness now uh, that perhaps the ways in which we approached bilingualism before um were appropriate for certain students at certain times, but maybe they're not just appropriate right now. So I think there is this um, consciousness of, um, it's not just adding another wheel, that's what you're talking about, the bicycle, right? It's not just uh, that there are two wheels and that we are balanced in any way, but you know, I've, I've called it this all-terrain vehicle, this idea that uh, what we do with our languages are, uh, is, is exactly to uh, make sure that we have the footing in the right place depending on the social context in which we're operating. But having said that, I think then what we have to think about is uh, what happens to us as bilingual beings, right? Uh, we have been taught to think, and I think it's again through our schooling, that, um, that we have one language and then the other. Um, and I think that is because um, the, um, the, the uh, I'm sorry, I just got a news about a, a student who was, was very ill, so I was distracted by the message. This is one of the things that happens with, uh, with all of this technology, that things come in all at the same time. Um, but is, it every, is everything okay? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I, I'm so oh, sorry. Okay, 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 all right. Later. Um, so, um, I, you know, one of the things that we have to realize is that 
we don't, we, that was a good model to think about sequential bilinguals, right? Who really start out with one language and then add another one. But not even that, because I think what happens if you are, a, you know, if you, you really develop as a bilingual being, if you have a, a bilingual subjectivity, is that there's a network that, you know, it's not input and output. It's not separate in any kind of way, but there's a network of meanings um, that is always emergent because it's emergent depending on, on the situation that you're in. Um, and I think that's a new way of thinking about language. Um, not new, but certainly um, a new, a, a new power, empowering situation for bilinguals, I think, uh, because all the studies of bilingualism, and now I'm not talking about foreign language education or second language education, but if you think back, Ana Maria, to all the studies of bilingualism that I did when I was a student, um, they were all about the influence of a minoritized language on a majority language, right? So in Spanish, the influence of the Quechua on Spanish or Guarani on Spanish or English on Spanish, but it, it was always the idea that you had to conform to a certain way of, of being as a bilingual. And I think what it has done it is that freed us up to understand that bilinguals are not two, two double monolinguals in one, something that Francois Grosjean said a long, long time ago, but we keep going back to it. Uh, but that usually that there is this uh, fluidity uh, uh, that, that is much more complex than simply two different wheels in a bicycle. Um, now, again, um, I think the other thing that is new, maybe, is that um, I think for maybe for the first time, um, there are bilingual scholars, minority bilingual scholars, that are making sense of their lives, right? Because, um, you know, the, the term itself was coined in, in Welsh um, by a Welsh educator, Ken Williams, uh, who one time started thinking the way in which we are teaching Welsh to Welsh bilingual children makes no sense because uh, they it's, they don't have two separate identities. They are one Welsh English bilingual child. And what that uh, uh, English Welsh bilingual child needs to do is to be able to use all their resources to make sense of what, uh, of, the of, of the world, of the lesson, whatever it is that is in front of him or her. Um, and and I think once, once they started with that, then it was easy for all of us who had been looking in um, to what was happening in, in language education, um, who had been told over and over again, the only way to acquire a new language is to do it separately, to do it this way. When we had been sitting in classrooms for a very long time where this is just not what was happening. It wasn't happening in foreign language classrooms. It wasn't happening in second language classrooms. It wasn't happening in bilingual classrooms. But still we, uh, you know, and I'm guilty of this myself when I was young, you know, it was, uh, we look up to our professors and we repeat what they've said. And so you don't believe your eyes, you kind of, and I think that's the biggest lesson, you know, when I talk to young people, it's the biggest lesson I could give all of you, you know, uh, which is, I think we have to, you know, we have to read, we have to reflect, we have to learn, but we have to especially trust what we're seeing, you know, and not think always that what we're seeing does not fit the reality that we've read in books and therefore we can't even reveal it. And this happens often. And I think that's new. The courage to say what we're seeing, I think is new. Um, the courage of foreign language educators to say, yeah, so I have a, 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 a space for that, for that other language. And I, I 
I agree fully that you have to have a space, right? You have to have a space because you have to have some input. You have to be able to take risks. So you have to have that space, but it's not a solid space because you can't expect children, you can't expect students to leave themselves behind when they engage in any kind of language, uh, in any kind of text, whether it's written or oral, right? Uh, when you read something, read something in Portuguese, um, you have to make sense of it through what you already know through. Uh, so, um, so that's, that I think is something that we have seen in foreign language classrooms. That's why many of the books are written in the dominant language and not the language of instruction, because we know that the students need that support. Um, and it doesn't happen in second language classroom. And it certainly wasn't happening in bilingual classrooms where everybody was describing it as this is the only way to do it. So I think that this is a new consciousness. It's, it's not a new idea. It's been happening. <laughs> it's been happening forever. I think what is new is for scholars to take it up and to say, okay, we're gonna make some sense of what is naturally happening. It's a sort of a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach. We have always been thinking, well, how do we develop practice from the theory that has been given to us? I always say for translanguaging, it started with practice. You know, what, what is it that we were seeing? And then how do you build a theory that responds to that practice? And then how do you adjust it? Because as we work with it, we realized um, uh, it had to be adjusted because it had to fit the language policies of the schools. So you can't go into a school and say, oh, whatever, what you're doing is completely wrong. You have to go into a school, find out what their policy is, find out what it is that they're doing, and then um, uh, think of, of the practice without giving up on the theory, but think of the practice. And then once you start with that practice, that affects your theoretical perspective. So, you know, some people say that we have, that I, you know, I'm going to speak only of me at this point, that I have shifted. I always say, you know, thank God we have Latin American songwriters for everything, because I always quote Mercedes Sosa, but she has a song that I love, which says, Todo cambia, y que, y que yo cambie, no es extraño, right? So I think that that's important. It's important to keep our eyes open to see. And when we see that what we've been saying is not right to be able to say, hey, sorry, <laughs> this, is, this is what I'm seeing now, you know, but, but to keep our eyes open, uh, to be wide awake to reality, I think that's what's important. Yeah, uh, you reminded me, um, I, I, I linked what you said now with uh, your answer to the first question I asked you, especially uh, uh, in what concerns teacher education, right? Uh, that we are, uh, it seems like translanguaging uh, has shifted our perception of the bilingual uh, individual, right? And uh, we feel more, um, let's say, safe uh, uh, to use all languages that are available, right? And I remember a lot your your husband's introduction to one of your book, Ricardo's, um, uses um, an image of a chair, right? A bilingual kid sitting uh, at a chair. And then if you see him from the outside, you see the languages separate, right? But if you see it from the inside, uh, it's just lots of, colors and all, all of them are mixed and it's very interesting, right? Well, um, so Amazing I'm going to ask- you remember That yeah. you remember that metaphor because it's a very good metaphor, yeah. It, it is, it is. I think it, it helps a lot to understand the, the, what is behind translanguaging, right? I think it, he, he puts it very well, right? The way he puts mm -hmm. it, it's perfect, very, uh, very clear. Uh, okay, so my next question is about bilingual education in Brazil in our context here, right? So uh, how do you think we can implement the translanguaging pedagogy, promoting the use of students' entire repertoire, right, in, in, the, in the classroom, 
in a Brazilian enrichment bilingual school context where the target language is not the majority language. Mm -hmm. Do you see a problem in that? Uh, what do you have to say about that? No, I don't see a problem at all because as I said, I, um, as I said before, I'm glad I said it before, um, I think it's very important to have a space uh, and you went with us, um, I think many times to El Puente, so you know what I'm talking about, right? You have to have a space in which the children are listening to that language and trying it out. Um, so that to me is uh, what all good bilingual programs do, whether they're, you know, all the, your, your, in your context, certainly, uh, bilingual programs in English, Portuguese, or in German, Portuguese. I mean, this is, this is what needs to be done. I think, however, um, we would have a, a much greater rate of success with everybody if we had some flexibility in, in these spaces, you know, and, um, and I'll repeat what, uh, what we wrote in the uh, article that I wrote with Maite Sanchez and Christian Solorza, which I know you know well, which is that um, there needs to be a space, uh, what we call um, for observation, for assessment, right? In which you have to use translanguaging to really understand what the child knows, right? If you're only assessing the child in, in one language and not the other, then what you're getting is an assessment of the language of that child. And that's, you know, it's, it's sometimes that's what you want. You know, that's why I always say there's a difference between using a language in the process of teaching and, you, and language as a product, right? There are times in which the product of instruction in the type of program that you are describing, Ana Maria, it's, is really a product in English, let's say, right? Whether it's oral or written. But what, that, what, what I think is very important is to remember that to get to that product, the process by which a person, a student, um, goes through is a process that cannot leave what they know behind, that this has to be leveraged in some way, so that the process of getting to that sophisticated oral presentation or persuasive written essay, uh, that process could very well entail all of the resources that that child has, right? Whether it's their language or their gestures or their ability to sing or their ability to act or their ability to draw. So that all of these are parts, part of language and part of making meaning. And this is what's needed to be built into the process to get to a product that after all is a monolingual product because that's the objective, right? So, um, so I think that that is necessary. Um, the second space that we tried to build in was this uh, uh, this, this space of um, scaffolding, right? Um, and I always say, well, it's like when you're in a classroom and a, a child or a student does not understand the lesson, what's the sense of keeping on teaching in a language that people do not understand? There's, there's, no, there's no meaning, you can't, learning is about making meaning for yourself. So our task as teachers, as you well know, is precisely to make it meaningful to students. That's why I told you I wasn't just speaking, I would speak to you as a, in a dialogue. But if it's not meaningful to the audience, if it's not meaningful to the child, to the student, it's, it's impossible. So um, to use it as a scaffold sometimes, you know, and I always say it's, it's very Vygotskyan. It's, it's a way of, of expanding the zone of proximal development, right? So that the child is not, so that if, if they're doing a, an exercise in English and the child doesn't understand, 
there is no reason why they can't use technology. There is no reason why they can't use uh, uh, a book in, in Portuguese to make sense of the, of the English. I mean, I just did a, um, a talk, a dialogue in French the other day, and I found myself using, you know, my phone all the time. So um, this is... Um, this is definitely something that that is a, a tool and i think most language teachers understand translanguaging as a scaffold i think the big change is um what we what we call the transformative space right and in the transformative space what we want is we want uh, a bilingual identity a bilingual subjectivity to be formed so that, um, and it does not happen in the programs that you're describing, but certainly in programs where there are a lot of minoritized, racialized children, what we find is that um, no matter what you do, the, the students go home thinking that the practices that they have at home are not um, valuable, they're not valid. Um, so, it's a way of really uh, making sure that they understand that their home language practices, that their own practices are valid, valuable, and that they bring knowledge. So um, I think that's, that's also important. So I think especially the second part, the part of the scaffolding uh, in, in um, foreign language teaching or in enrichment bilingual programs um, I think is important to understand just as it's important to understand that bilingualism is just not an addition of a whole box which is another language bilingualism uh, is the ability to incorporate new features of a language new features into your own repertoire, right? So to make it your own. Uh, and, you know, again, you know, I like to think of the network, right? Rather than the two wheels, uh, because the two wheels makes it accessible only to some and not to others. The network works for everybody, whether they're poor, rich, able, disabled, deaf, you know, whatever. And I think it's a network idea that is important in translanguaging. Yeah, um, this reminds me of uh, one idea that you always give to teachers. And I heard you say that many times, especially at Dos Puentes when we were there, to create a space, a physical space in the classroom uh, where kids can do whatever they want in and use their entire repertoire. So you have everything in English or Spanish, etc. but you have that space that they can choose the books in the language they want, they can play in the language they want, they are free. And it's wonderful to see that because sometimes they, you know, they mix everything and they translanguage all the time, right? It's wonderful to have this freedom, right? To feel free of this yeah. It's wonderful. It is, by the way, the way that bilingualism works at home. If you've seen any family, any any Brazilian bilingual families, right? Um, they do it that way, right? You you have uh, books in Portuguese and books in English. You don't have them in, in separate bins. You don't tell the children that they can only use one set of books one day and one set of books the other day. You make them available. The children read them in one language or the other. You know, they, uh, they sometimes narrate them in the other language. They laugh. Uh, so that this is... Um, these are the practices that any bilingual family has, whether they're poor immigrant families or rich uh, elite families. Um, this is how bilingualism works and somehow we're afraid of it. Uh, so, and that's, that's interesting. That's an interesting idea that we are afraid of something that is so natural. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and thinking about that, um, uh, I have one more question and then I'm going to uh, ask some questions from the audience, right? Uh, I was thinking about the difference uh, between the context that you have in New York City and the context that we have here, at, at least in Porto Alegre, I'm not even talking about other regions of Brazil. 
Uh, but we have uh, in public schools uh, something uh, which is right the opposite of what you have in New York City, uh, that you have uh, in, uh, bilingual kids who don't like to be bilingual because uh, being bilingual for them it means that they are like less than the local uh, kids, right? And um, here we have uh, something that is a, a little more uh, problematic because how can we uh, use a translanguage pedagogy uh, in a context of additional language, not of bilingual education, but additional language teaching in Brazilian public schools uh, when the main objective of the teachers is to prevent students from, from not turning their backs on the new language. Because what they say is that, why would I want to learn English or I will never be able to go to Disney World or, you know, do what rich kids do or anything like that. Mm. Uh, how would you, you know, uh, relate translanguaging with this context? Mm. Because I think translanguage is, is present in any kind of language teaching, not only bilingual education in my oh, view. Right? Everywhere. Um, it's interesting what you're saying, because I would have expected the opposite. Because uh, all through the world, of course, English is... Um, so powerful um, uh, that uh, that I see, you know, I see it as um, sometimes kids think it's the, the ticket out of poverty, um, and so it's it's interesting that you don't seem to have that issue in Brazil at all. Um, but um, you know, I think. The, the idea that um, I, I, I think that we as language teachers, again, think of, lang of a language as a box, a structure that has to be added in some ways fully as an entity. And I think that's what the kids see. The kids understand that they're never going to be able to get this box. But I think if instead of thinking of the box, of the full thing, we think of just features again, you know, that again, that they could be added um, to their repertoire. I think that that uh, would go a long way. I think here the, the Europeans with their concept of plurilingualism um, have done some good work because I do think that the idea of plurilingualism is that um, there is no need for what we used to call full competency, right? That there is no need for full proficiency. That the idea is to have um, knowledge and understandings of uh, as many languages as you want, many languages, as many features of languages as you want, um, but not fully in any kind of way, and that no one needs to be, this idea of a full bilingual, I think, is what, um, what scares people, right? Uh, and scares these kids, that you say, uh, are, are afraid of uh, and have no interest in, in uh, learning um, an additional language. So I think that breaking it up so that it doesn't seem like it's a, a full box, um, I think, uh, you know, would go a long way. I also think that, um, I, and this is, I, I think it's, it's very, very important. I think that when we teach a language, we also have to teach um, the ways in which that, that, that language has been constructed historically and the reasons why it's been constructed in that way. Um, and the reasons why there are the hierarchies that have been linguistically formed that have nothing to do with the value of language. It has to do with privilege of, of certain nation states and privilege of certain people. Um, so I think a, a critical approach to language education where students, um, if for example, if you were going to teach English in Brazil, where first of all, the idea that you're not teaching just a full language, right? But you're teaching 
these features that, that they, they can incorporate and they can own, and they can own as their own without having to compare them to a, a monolingual Anglo somewhere, you know, it's, uh, and because that's the other problem with our fields that we have always compared, right? But to think that bilinguals have a right to have their own uh, language, their own repertoire. So that, first of all. And then secondly, the idea that um, to make sure that when we teach a language, we also teach alongside of it the, um, the ways in which the, this language has been historically used um, for domination, for colonization, for oppression. Um, I think if we were critical with that, you know, if the language education profession was a bit more critical with the issue of language and how language has been used to oppress, to keep privilege away from people, um, to separate, to exclude, to include some, to exclude others. I, I think uh, students would be very interested in, in learning more. Um, but we, we teach language sort of as, as a subject that is separate, that is not, not in the sociopolitical context in which it exists and it has been constructed historically. That's a very interesting point of view because language is present in everything. We exist through language, right? So, uh, and this, uh, I'm going to link to a question from uh, one person. It's Beto, okay? He's a master's student in um, uh, additional language and applied linguistics at PUCI. Uh, he asks, do you feel official language policies from governments across the world, especially in the US, are evolving or are they still primarily colonialist? It has a lot to do with what you just said, right? But now in your context, what do you see? Yeah, yeah no, I, I see language policy in the US not changing. <laughs> um, um, I see, um, as a matter of fact, I would say that our language policy has gotten more restrictive, um, especially since the Reagan years, since 1980. Um, uh, we had a, historically a period in which um, we had a more liberal language policy. Um, the years in which uh, bilingual education was tied to community struggles, civil rights, uh, issues that went beyond language and were about housing, were about jobs, were about equality and justice. Um, and that was a very short period. <laughs> um, but we, saw, I think that there was a lot of progress made those years. Um, but in 1980, after Reagan was elected, uh, this all started to shift. Um, and what has happened in the U.S. with um, language policy, as you know, is that um, it, it became more and more restricted. Uh, the U.S. doesn't have an official language, even though, of course, English is the language. Um, but actually, the U.S. English movement, which happened in the 1980s also, which was a movement to get to change the Constitution to name English as official, failed. But the states picked it up, uh, and many of the states passed official English uh, policies. Uh, and the most restrictive, as you know, uh, Ana Maria, were um, California and also Arizona and Massachusetts that made bilingual education illegal. Um, and we lived with those illegal policies from 2000 to just recently, um, to, to 2018. Um, so 20 years of uh, bilingual education in the state with uh, a, a lot, a lot of uh, Spanish speakers, for example, not, not having any access to any kind of help. 
through a policy, a language education policy that would work for them. But of course, after 20 years of teaching them in English only and failing miserably and understanding that they were getting farther and farther behind rather than better, um, there was a referendum and that was overturned in California and Massachusetts at least. Um, but I think what we have done in the US is sort of come up with something different. And I, I always say it's a camouflage, it's, you know, it's hidden, which is this uh, dual language programs. And the dual language programs for the most part are what are called two way. That is, the idea is to have um, immigrant children who are not speakers of English with um, speakers of English only, and to try to put them together so that they learn each other's language. So, you know, it, it, if you think about it, it's a, it's a, a neoliberal uh, policy that um, benefits um, white students who want to become bilingual rather than the minoritized students uh, which were the original goal and target of bilingual education in the United States. Um, now those programs sometimes, and you've seen them in action, Ana Maria, um, have been able to camouflage again themselves so that they serve a minority community. So, you know, there's a lot, uh, even though they have to show that 50% of them are English language learners and 50% of them are not. There is uh, sometimes there are in communities where 90% of the kids, for example, are uh, Spanish speaking. And so you can do that without causing this problem of, but in, in the US, um, the language education policy right now favors <clears throat> two way dual language programs. Um, and they are off, it's often used for gentrification purposes. That is, when neighborhoods, um, uh, when you want to attract white parents to public schools, you open up a dual language bilingual program and all of a sudden you have an influx of white parents who want their children to become bilingual. And it's, it's to me, it's, it's very interesting because, um, in New York City, uh, the conflict has been between the French dual language programs and the Spanish dual language programs. And of course, the French are higher up in the hierarchy and it's caused all kinds of issues and all kinds of problems. Whereas um, the Spanish programs have been able to draw more from the community, which of course, because they've been here longer, uh, uh, the range of bilingualism in the community is greater because they're, they're not just recent arrivals. Uh, there are many who have been here many, many years. So generations actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you said that I was there, but I was in New York City, and I think New York City is a bubble, right? It's different. Yeah. I have this feeling that it's totally different from the rest of the U.S. But I just want to say to people, we don't have much more time. I think we have time for two more questions. We have people from all over Brazil uh, watching you. Uh, but if people want to ask questions, you can ask through Facebook, okay? You can just post your questions there. I have a question, another question here from Ana Vial, who is a master in, from our university in applied linguistics. She asks, how can we foster bilingual principles in our lessons or schools, given that there is a strong ideology in Brazil that people use only Portuguese here and that most teachers do not speak other languages? And unfortunately, this is true. Uh, Sometimes we have, at public school especially, right, we have uh, teachers of other curricular components that have to cover for the English uh, discipline or the, the English subject because there is no English teacher to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do about the teachers. <laughs> I think that's, uh, I, I think we have to be more flexible as to 
who can teach um, and who cannot teach because I think that everybody can teach. But um, I, I do think that every teacher has the responsibility um, to make sure that they understand who the children are, uh, who the students are linguistically also, right? Uh, and I think if you asked in the classrooms who are, you know, what, what if, if, if you get the students engaged in a conversation, uh, you would find that there is a lot more multilingualism in the classroom than just only Portuguese, which is, you know, how the teachers see it. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's, it's a, a responsibility of all teachers to uh, make sure that you address the multilingualism of your students. Um, as to what to do with um, preparing teachers, um, I think that there is a great need for uh, better teacher preparation, better language teacher preparation. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it can't just be language teachers. They have to be critical language teachers. They have to be able to um, also be critically aware. And I think this critical component is what's going to make um, our discipline a little bit more fashionable or, or you know, useful uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think this is our last question. Uh, I see uh, people sometimes um, a little con concerned about um, standard language, right? Academic language. So my last question has to do with this translanguaging of pedagogy. Um, in what ways do you think that translanguaging classrooms um, may be a, a better choice to develop students' academic proficiency in the target language. I'm talking not only in bilingual um, education, but also in uh, additional language teaching, right? Well, you know, it's interesting that you asked me about academic language because I just finished writing uh, an article about it. Um, in the United States, as, as you know, uh, academic language has become the buzzword, right? Everybody says, uh, why are they failing? Because they don't have academic language. But then when you ask and when you read what, what is academic language, no one knows what the hell academic language is uh, because the descriptions are basically of um, school texts uh, written by um, usually monolingual English speakers in a certain way, right? I mean, you know, we talk about the differences in discourse between Latin American essays and American academic articles, for example. Um, what is more academic is, um, is uh, you know, and, and that, that, that is a big thing for me because we have been isolating features of what makes academic language. And what we don't realize is that the only thing that we're doing we are, we're, is we are looking at texts in standard English for the social sciences. And those are the features that we say are academic. We're not looking at humanistic literature. And that to me is, is also very academic. So, I mean, we have to be careful with what academic means. Um, Having said that, I do think that part of schooling, part of what we've always done in school is to um, develop st a standard, right? Uh, which we have to remember that it's constructed and it's artificial, but um, I think that it's the wish of every parent uh, to make sure that their children can use language in standard ways. Whether that makes a difference or not is for another discussion, but, but I think that is, that is parental wishes. Um, and I, what I always say is we have always started there. We've always started with a standard and we failed miserably. And what we're talking about is giving 
students an opportunity, possibilities to use language in more fluid ways, because the more you use language conceptually for different things, the more opportunities you have to use language, the more that language develops. And I am certain that if you give students the opportunities to read, to engage, to think, to create, to imagine, to love, to do all the things that children are so good at uh, with whatever language resources they have, they are then going to tap into the world differently. And through that tapping, they're going to be able to access uh, what some of us call standard language uh, much better than trying to impose it on them uh, sending them to remedial classrooms where, you know, features are isolated, uh, where they're not learning anything interesting, where their imagination is not tapped. And I think that is the problem. The problem is where do you start? Um, I think we all um, understand that that is what we want developed uh, at the end of schooling. But maybe not in first grade where we start already, you know, putting up barriers. So that's that's a little problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you think we have uh, time for one more question? One last question? I have yeah. Time. Okay. Um, so. Uh, okay. So. Another thing, another question from a teacher here, Bibiana, she is a teacher, she's one of our uh, undergraduate students, is uh, how not to confuse uh, translanguaging with translation in the classroom, right? Because lots of teachers think that translanguaging is the same as translating things. Right. right. So let me just begin by saying that, you know, a long time ago, <laughs> um, probably before I learned, I uh, started learning um, another language, the grammar translation method was what, what was used. And that of course became very unfashionable after the communicative approach and all of that. And you know, sometimes we throw away the baby with the bathwater. And I am not, uh, I am convinced that translation has a, a role. It doesn't have a role that is, uh, that, that can dominate. I mean, we have to have the communicative part, but I've seen um, teachers, language teachers work with translation in very successful ways because the students are really thinking about, you know, how do you, how do you, put this concept into other words and so I, I think that translation has a role in the language classroom. I know that it's not, um, uh, it's not um, something that people say easily but I do think that there's a role. Uh, you can't do it all the time because as we know if, uh, if um, the input that we're hearing is translated all the time there's no reason for for trying to make sense of it. It's like the Americans uh, with Fahrenheit and centigrade. I mean, for a long time, they tried to change us uh, to go from uh, centigrade to fent from Fahrenheit to centigrade. And they used to always put the two of them and eventually they gave up because nobody learned anything because, you know, you weren't looking at the other, you were only looking at one. So translation all the time is not good. Translation used, um, used wisely, I think works. Um, the difference between translanguaging and translation is that usually translation uh, is about rendering the concept of one people into another conceptual mindset of other people. And translanguaging is right in the middle. In other words, it's not about going from these concepts to these concepts, but translanguaging is about being a making sense of, of language. When you're living, as Gloria and Saldua used to call it, entre mundos, when you're living in, this, in these borderlands, which are not here or there. Translation has this idea that you can you can 
you, you have to you have this concept in this culture and now you are rendering it in another language for another culture translanguaging is about bringing those um, cultural concepts together uh, and I think epistemologically is different. Yeah, I remember you gave me Ansaldua's um, uh, text to read and it's life-changing. After you read that, you understand how we live on the border all the time, right? When we are bilingual. Well, Ophelia, I have no words to thank you for, Diana, Maria, you know, thank you. I, Obrigada. I'm, I'm, I, I am really always amazed at uh, my Brazilian friends and scholars and uh, glad to be talking to you. Thank you. Gracias. Well, it was a great pleasure. We, have, we had a lot of people attending uh, our talk and uh, asking questions and people all over the country. And I have no words to thank you. It was a wonderful moment. And then I got to see you, right? Because we never see each other. We never have the time. So it was great. I think uh, Simone has some, a few words to say also. Simone. And, uh, really like to thank you again Philip, for everything it was great i'm sure everybody loved and i'd like to uh, thank anna maria yeah as well for for everything and the audience we had a lot of people watching us so it was very uh, very nice and very important for our graduate program so thank you very much I, I just want to say one word at the end which is you know i i want to make sure that just like I said, that I had to keep my eyes open and look at my own reality when even my, my professors were telling me to look elsewhere. I think that every people have to look at their own reality. So what I say, I say because of my experience, um, which is not your experience. So you have to make sense of all of this work um, for the benefit of the many in Brazil in whichever way you do it. Thank you very so much. It's so true. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank everyone. you very much, everybody. Bye-bye.